Good evening and welcome to the shop. Here it is, another Thursday night, Shop Night Live here in Canterbury, New Hampshire. And I'm glad you stopped by. Thanks for coming by. Sorry we're a little late tonight. We're late. Well, I guess we're always late, right? That's what some people say. <laughs> but that's because, especially this week, it's been wild around here. We have been burning the candle at both ends with a course that's ongoing. We just finished our fourth day of class right here in the shop. And tomorrow's the graduation day. And each participant is making one of these, one of these cool shaker end tables. And if you saw that course, you recognize that table. We did the shaker end table course not long ago. And we actually built this one here. And can you remember who won that? I'm so bad. Oh, with I, it's out in, in uh, I, I'm sorry. You're the name. Sorry. I know. My mind like is that. just a little bit clogged right now. All right. But I apologize if the person's watching. <laughs> We really, you we really, really do, do mean a lot to us. Yes, and it's not for lack of desire, believe me. Okay, so um, anyway, we're, we're using this drawing. Excuse me. We're using this drawing. <laughs> She's looking down again. At oh, the, I'm sorry. You guys okay, are commenting. Okay, not off to a great start. No, that's, you're awesome. Okay. Don't worry. You're the camera lady. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's now so this nice. is... Our drawing for that table I just showed you. So we've been walking through this with the class. It's been a lot of fun where we did the whole mortise and tenon and tapering. We had an intense day of dovetailing today with uh, dovetailing the drawer and making these, these half blind dovetails up in front. And we got to finish that and, and get the table finished tomorrow. But one of the things we did today was handed out the tops. Remember last week on Shop Night Live? We talked about making great tabletops. And I had uh, some smaller tops like this one. And we glued them all up to hide the seams and had a nice two board tops. And I already handed those out to the students and they started hand planing them already today. And um, I'm going to mess around with that one in a little bit. But I also want to show you the huge tabletop that I showed you last week, the Canterbury Town Office Cherry Tabletop. And, well, it's right over there. You, you can swing show it. to it. Yeah. Okay. So here, here it is. I got it glued up. I'm not going to talk about it long, so don't spend too much time. Oh, look down here. Look at that's Jerry's table. <laughs> He's going to actually ship it home, so we didn't glue it up all the way yet. Jerry lives in Tennessee. Yeah. So uh, there are six people this week at the class. We capped it at six because we just wanted the experience to be as full as it could be. Yeah, and we've got, and we've, we're social distancing yep. as best we can. You know, I mean, we are, we are a small gathering of less than 10. So it's been a lot of fun. Um, anyway, we are, I, I've got that project on my mind, but I've also got that Canterbury, that large shaker table uh, that is going in the Canterbury Town office. I've got to get that ready and get that over to Mark, who's going to finish it. And I've got to get that to him Saturday. So I've got to glue it up, but I need to surface it. Now, I was thinking about, Surfacing large tabletops is, has been, it can be tricky because there's a lot of ways to flatten a tabletop. You're, most times you're going to run it through a thickness planer and get it to dimension. And if you buy your materials already thicknessed at a lumber dealer and it's all dressed to a certain thickness, it's probably close to three quarters of an inch thick. And it's going to have some ripples in it. They run it through the planers. It's a higher speed, and they're not, they're not as careful to get that really fine surface. But even if you have a really nice planer, it doesn't usually leave a pristine surface. 
there's this pressure roller that's on the entry before it hits the cutter, and then a pressure roller as it exits. So that kind of bumps the wood a bit as it enters and as it exits, and you get a slightly little deeper bite called a snipe on the entry and the exit. And this even happens with uh, drum sanders and wide belt sanders, believe it or not. To some degree, it can happen. Now, I'm sure there's some sanders out there that are so trustworthy, they're fine. But I have had the experience, the unhappy experience, and maybe you have, of being in the finishing room, finishing a beautiful dining top, thinking you had it really well sanded, and seeing that slight shadow of a horizontal straight line going across and knowing immediately what it is. It's a snipe, or sometimes they can occur in the middle of a board if it was being sanded and it was bumped or something happened. And it's so annoying. But, <laughs> but um, so you want to be sure before you sand your tabletop, especially if it's going in the Canterbury town offices for years, you don't want it sitting there with a snipe. You want to leave the snipes to the town officials who are arguing. <laughs> and uh, you don't want yours to be the most prominent snipe in the room. Let's put it that way. So I want, I want to feel good about that top. And I don't want to walk in there and see that every time I happen to go in with a complaint. Because <laughs> we complain a lot in this town. Anyway, there's a number of ways to flatten and remove that from the top. And I want to talk about the first way that I used, actually, a fair amount when I was with Pug Moore. All right, I'm coming out of the closet. I am a pretty good belt sander. <laughs> Check this baby out. <laughs> no, I have. I've, I've done a fair amount of belt sanding. At Pug Moore's in North Carolina, there was a... It was a busy shop, and you had to sand the surfaces. And at that time, in those days when they were setting up shop, they were not like drum sanders and surfacing sanders around that you could buy easily like there are now. But they had amazing belt sanders available. And some of you know what I'm talking about. This is kind of a, like the one that Pug had. This is a Porta Cable A3 model. And I'm telling you, this thing's heavy. It's only a three-inch uh, sandpaper, a three-inch wide wheel. And this, this is called like the locomotive style because you literally feel like you've got a locomotive. It's like a little train. It is. But he had the 500, the Porta Cable 500. I would love to get one of those someday. Just, you know, they're harder to find because the parts for them aren't available like they were. But I've got this A3, I have another one. I'm not, I haven't messed around with it too much. The cord is like taped up and I can see copper. So I don't think I'm plugging it in real time, real soon. But, <laughs> <laughs> and it's probably missing some little parts. You know, it's the kind of thing you gotta put the oil in before you start for the day. That's the, how, what we're talking about here. But the beauty of that uh, Porta Cable 500 belt sander was it was four inch wide platen. And the platen is just this flat surface down here. So the sandpaper rolls over the wheels and the drive wheel here in the back. And it goes over this smooth piece of metal that has a cork backing. It's made to be really kind of soft and flat. And so all you have to do with a good belt sander is just glide it around flat on the surface. And while it's going, and, and just balance it so it doesn't, it leaves a nice smooth sanding. So even if you had snipes, a skilled person with a belt sander could do an amazing job. <laughs> this doesn't sound like epic woodworking, right? <laughs> but it was fun to use that thing because really fast you could, you could have the side of a chest of drawers smoothed out and it would be ready for your, your final um, sanding, so you'd go to a smaller sanders. But um, 
I miss that, Sandra. You know, it was interesting. I heard recently uh, Chris Bexford, who some of you know is quite the uh, craftsman. He's, I think he's got close to 50 articles in Fine Woodworking Magazine. And he's a master of shaker furniture up there in Maine. And I was happy to get to know him a bit as uh, uh, f from being on the, on the show. He was on that episode. And I've seen him around. I'm looking forward to seeing him at Fine Woodworking Live next time it ever happens. <laughs> but he's funny because he he's unapologetic. And he's, he's a confessed belt sander <laughs> as well. But he has like... Um, Someone must know what he has. I think it's a three-inch uh, skill, or I saw him write it, and he talked about it, and I was like, wow, I never, I never really got into them outside of the, a, the, the uh, 500 that the Porta Cable that Pug had. So anyway, I don't really use belt sanders hardly ever anymore because there is a little problem. I don't have the reliable, trustworthy sander that that was and it was such a large platen that it was pretty easy to keep flat on the table as you moved around and in the weight was so good that you just had to basically make sure you were keeping everything in balance but there is something that can go wrong with a belt sander and that's what used to annoy me and that's what happened when I used I got my own belt sander a port of cable when I went on my own and it's a three inch by 24 so not that impressive compared to the 500 but it's got the same situation going on with the cork and the platen but there's something about the corners when you're sanding as you change direction sometimes it just it rides up ever so slightly and you'll get a dig like a like a little trough and so now you gotta sand and get that out it's like a deep kind of skid mark but it's it's just like a half inch wide and so these are annoying too I mean they, they can be a problem and when you're using them you got to deal with this oh shoot that wasn't impressive <laughs> <laughs> good try oh note to self <laughs> Test the sander before you do your big demo. <laughs> Hold on a second. All right, so I had it plugged in, I thought. <laughs> so here's the cord. goes all the way up in here. All right, let's try that again. Should I be turning down the microphone? Is this no. going to hurt our ears? Okay. So the other thing about belt sanders... <laughs> is you got to deal with this. Uh. That's a screamer, right? Sorry if I hurt your ears there. But it's annoying, and the dust goes everywhere. It's not elegant at all. It's not fine woodworking. <laughs> so <coughs> I already uh. felt the dust come out from that. Anyway, this one's missing the bag. This one has the classic old porta cable bag. Is that it's awesome? Nice. I love bags. I don't know what the age or vintage of this is, but maybe someone who knows. I did actually contact. There's some guy who's the Porta Cable Sander guy. And when I got this uh, years ago, it was some guy who wanted just to get rid of them. He said, hey, you, you want these? Sure. So they're up in the attic. <laughs> <laughs> I have another one like it. I feel like something good's going to happen someday with these. Yeah, they're going to get out of the attic. <laughs> That's the good thing. It's coming. No. <laughs> you never know when you need it. You might need that. This is the lie. The All creeping, right. Creeping, creeping lie. I'm going to say sayonara to my belt sander for tonight because we're going to talk about another way of making sure you remove that dastardly snipe that can occur from the planer or sanders. You don't want to be haunted and have that thing show up when you're in your finishing stages or walk into the town office. Okay, so the other way to guarantee you've removed it is to hand plane your surface. So that's what we've actually been doing today. 
uh, there was some beautiful hand planing going on in this very room. I didn't do it one swipe of it. And I've been running around, making sure everybody's happy. And I think everybody is. <laughs> but, but I, so I didn't get a lot of time. Like, I didn't even practice tonight. So I don't know really what's going to happen. But let's see. So I just want to show you quickly. Do you ever practice? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes I just want to make sure it's going to work. So sure. like when you go to turn on the belt sander, yeah, you yeah. know, it happens. Anyway, I've got, I just want to show you a quick, uh, I'm not doing the whole uh, sharpening thing, but this is my method for tuning up hand plane irons to get them really nice and ready to do fine work. Now, this is the iron for the old trusty number five that you've seen many times if you've watched this. And I actually, since I had a conversation with um, Deneb up at Lee Nielsen, I started messing around, changing the angle. I used to always make the angle of the grind on my hand planes to 25 to 30 degrees. But he recommended, and I think it's kind of because of the steel in their planes to to uh, grind at 30 and hone at 35. So you're up at 35 degree bevel. So I've been trying that. And it actually, it gives you a longer lasting edge because it's not, it doesn't come to as fine a point. It doesn't get damaged as quickly. But technically it's a little less sharp because you have a steeper angle to the, to the uh, point. So let's just see how it works. Now the other thing that I always like to put on my, my regular bench planes that are going to work surfaces is a camber. And a camber is a soft arc to the cutting edge. So rather than this edge of this plane being dead flat across, it's got a soft little camber to it. And I'm looking at that. Anyway, I'm a little distracted. So it's got this soft little camber. And what the way I achieve that is just through some repetition on the stones. Now, on, you can create it on 1,000 grit. That's what I usually try to make it on. And the way I make it happen is I have this, this kind of guide with a narrow wheel. Any guide with a narrow wheel will work well. This is a honing guide. So I've got it set in there at 35 degrees, which I use this 35 degree uh, bevel setter. I guess that's what it is. From Veritas. It's very nice from Veritas. <laughs> and I've got, um, so I'm established at 35. I'm up there. But when I start working it on the stone, this is how it works. That wheel rests on the stone and it holds you right at 35, exactly where you want it. So I start pushing forward, and I'm kind of pushing down on this side for a couple strokes, and then I start to move over to the other side. Even though it looks flat on the stone, I'm applying more pressure on the other corner. So I, after a few swipes like this, I start to create a soft little radius. Let me get some water on there. This, um, I came off of the 1,000 grit. This is a 4,000 grit stone. And I'm just uh, freshening it up. And it's, this offers a little bit of a flattening. It's a preparation for the finer grit stones. It's a Nagora stone. It also brings up a slurry, which helps it cut a little better. So then here I am. I'm on there. I'm going to start working it. See, I'm pushing it down and in, down and in. All right, let's see what I did. I think I have to blow my nose, sorry. Thank you. Okay, so now I'm going to just check it out. 
and I'm getting a nice hone there. I'm going to hit it a little more. Uh, Michael's asking, did you first grind the bevel to the new angle and are now refining it on the stone? Um, I didn't grind this recently, Michael. I, I had it already there, but um, you could grind it. I started actually, if you have a 25 degree or a 30 degree angle on, existing on your iron and you want to go to a 35, just set your honing guide to 35 because you, you start with this little secondary bevel and you can easily recreate it at 35. And then I've been working this for a while, so I've got, it doesn't even look like I have a secondary barrel anymore. It goes all the way out. Now, I don't know if you'll be able to pick this up on the video camera. Like, maybe against my shirt. Uh, can you see that? You zoom in. That that rocks a little bit. See how I'm rocking it? Can you see that? Mm -hmm. You can see it? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so there, that's the little soft arc. It's very subtle, but it's on that edge. After just doing that enough, that's the camber. That's the secret for it to work really well. So that makes pushing a shaving a little easier because you've actually got a little swipe um, to it because, like, the scrub planes are very narrow, and they can take a really aggressive shaving because they have a very strong camber and then narrower. And that's the old way, pre-machines, of flattening wood was a scrub plane and a strong young apprentice. <laughs> <laughs> that was the way. So that's how you did it. And then you refined it with finer and finer planes. But by having a camber, even on your finer planes, it lets it work really nice. You get this very, very subtle scalloping on the surface. But it also prevents the corners from digging. That's a pain. When you have a, a plane, if I had a dead flat edge on there, and I was trying to smooth the surface, if I have a straight edge, one of those corners is more than likely, or, or even both, are going to be digging. Now, some people use the technique of just rounding the corners. And yes, that will soften it. You won't have as hard a cut, but you still have the noticeable cut from that existing there. We just talked about that today. Someone was experiencing that. So the camber is really a fine way to go to get it on there. Now, I'm going to use this 10,000 grit stone, which is amazing. Got this uh, from Lee Nielsen. It's a Oishi. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Someone tell me. <laughs> it's the Oishi stone, 10,000 grit. And man, you notice the difference. This is water stone. I'm going to bring the slurry up a little bit with the Nagora stone. This always makes you feel like you're a, a master of stones. It's a little softer, I mean, but it cuts amazingly fast and gives you a beautiful polish. That little divot there is from a quarter inch chisel. <laughs> Let that be a warning to you. It's hard to hone a quarter inch chisel freehand it on this stone without it digging in. All right, so I've already gone through the 4,000, the 1,000 grit, and now I'm going right on this. I cleaned off the other grits, and here we go. I'm going to, again, accentuate the camber. Tom, while you're doing that, David's asking, does, doesn't the camber create a very slight divot with each stroke of the plane, and what do you do about that? Yeah, what I was saying, David, it's so subtle. It's a... Uh, I wouldn't describe it as a divot. <laughs> you Tom knows see what divots are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the kind of divots where you drive the club into the ground so much that the size of a massive toupee goes flying. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, it's not a divot. Let's stop using that term. It's a <laughs> subtle scallop. It's just a very, I mean, it's so subtle. But you don't, so you don't get the overlapping. And yes, I do sand after that many times. So it doesn't show up. And sometimes when it does show up, 
like even card scraping will show up like this. I love it. I think it's such a, it, you see like the maker's hand. It's not, it's not super obvious. When I show you a camera, I'm, I'm talking a very subtle curve. You'll see how it works here in a minute. Well, I hope you will, because I didn't practice this. No, I know, I know you will. I've done it enough. <laughs> so now I'm on the back, and where's my little rule? Okay. So I've, I've got the, the faces beautifully honed. Look at that. You see that glimmering? Do you lose any sharpness this way, Dick Gear is asking? What? With the camera? Is no. no, no, it's as sharp. It's just, it's. I'm talking about the shape of the cutting edge. It's just slightly radius this way, okay. But the cutting, the bevel edge is as sharp. You you can push it through even faster. You can cut your hands just as just as easily. You can, yeah. So now I'm lapping the back. I'm on the back bevel. I've got this little thin ruler as my. It's holding it up a little bit because I don't need the back of this plane to be perfectly flat. And this helps you to hone a mass, a really beautiful polished surface right out to the edge. So let's get that cleaned off. You can see it. You see that? Can you see that? Am I helping? Can you see yeah, it I'm reflecting not. in the light? Yep. Mm -hmm. Tell me when. How about this side? Yeah, it's cool. Okay, beautiful. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to do is strop it. I'm going to throw this over here. What did you do to flatten the stone? Stuart's asking. Before the Nagora, I use this little Nagora stone. But before that, I have a flattening stone. Uh, not, a, not a great one. I want one of those. Um, I don't think it's, I don't know if it's, it's not DMT that makes them. Maybe it is. But they're super pricey there. They're these thick plates, because you've got to keep your stones flat, your water stones. And someone probably knows what I'm talking about. They're, they're between $100 and $200 for this plate. It's a diamond plate, like four inches. They, have, they recommend them at Lee Nielsen, but they don't sell them, I don't think they're. Maybe they do. But uh, anyway, that kind of plate is ideal, because it's dead flat, and it cuts really fast. But between flattenings, I, I, use this, I use this type of flattening stone, like this. And I put it face down on my stones to resurface them. It's not ideal. It doesn't cut as fast. And believe it or not, even these stones go out of flat. So it's kind of annoying when you get a truing flattening stone and it doesn't stay flat. It's supposed to, right? All right, so let's get on with it. I'm, I'm got some green rouge on a piece of pine here. And man, we loaded this up with rouge this week. So <laughs> I've got it on the bevel, and I'm going to drag it toward me. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. All right, that was twenty. I don't know. Some people say you got to go more. I think 20 is enough. <laughs> I'm on the back now. This is going to hone it and also helps if I have any kind of hairline. Um, lapping plate? Is that the name? I think it is a lapping plate, yeah. They're awesome, those things. <clears throat> anyway, here we go. <clears throat> So I'm going to put the um, chip breaker onto the iron and slide it up and come back off the edge. I go about a 32nd to a 16th, right in there, really close. Gives a nice support and helps curl the chips there and reduces the tear out. Okay. Have you tried a DMT stone? That's what I'm talking about, I think. Uh, the perforated ones? I have one. Like this? It's not a stone. It's a, it's a diamond plate. Is that what you're talking about? Um, I'm, chip? I'm, chip? I'm, I don't know. Who is it? Chip is asking. Chip, I, I have this. This is the only DMT. Oh, no, this is Duo Sharp. 
I think it's DMT is what I'm talking about. For DMT, the diaflat, diamond-coated lapping plate. Yes. That's the Thank one. Thank you, Dan. So anyway, uh, that's what I would recommend. I've used them, but I've never, I don't happen to have one right now. Someday we'll. Why not just use all diamond stones to sharpen, Bruce Bryan's asking. Um, you certainly can. I mean, a lot of people like to. Uh, I just, I, they're very fast, but I could get in some arguments with this, but I think to get the finest edges, water stones are the, the king. They're fast cutting as well. There's something about the diamond. I don't think it quite gets you quite, and I don't have the whole set. I haven't tried the super fine, so maybe they are great, but from what I've heard talking to people, they, they excel. The beauty is they stay flat, but the uh, water stones are just amazing at um, cutting fast because they're always getting refreshed and giving you a fresh cutting edge. So that, that could be a long kind of nerdy argument to get into, but um, the water stones are also significantly less expensive than going with the diamond, but you know what, if people just find the the type they want. You know, there's, there's oil stones, there's ceramic stones, there's water stones, there's diamond stones. There's sandpaper on a plate. I mean, you can do all kinds. Find a method that works that you will go to and use and get you sharp like this, and you will love it. Okay, I'm going to set this aside. Uh, does it make a difference if you're moving towards hard or soft woods? What's that? Uh, Chip's asking... How sharp I'm you are? Assuming how sharp it is, yeah. Um, I've never. <laughs> I'm just getting sharp, whether it's softer. In fact, the softer woods, in some ways, you know, they will squish. And I mean, it's really easy to plane white pine. Some woods just are really friendly to taking a shaving. Like mahogany was a dream. Walnut is so is really nice. Um, some of the, oh, some of those Northwest cedars, uh, the, the ones they do those shaving contests with, like planing contests. Anyway, let me uh, move on. I was going to show you the card scraper as well, but I want to first try this out, okay? I'm kind of eager. I'm going to warm up on one of the class tables. This is the one, this was mine, because it's got some issues here. So I always take the deficient ones. And that's why all the furniture in our house has issues. So it feels, I feel right at home with the furniture I've put in the house. All right, so here we go. I'm going to knock that in, leave the thing down, and here we are. I've got a little knot there, but that might be an issue, but let's see. All right, so I'm going to back it off a little bit and start in. Nothing's happening. I'm going to dial it forward, and I'm looking to see where that shaving is going to start coming. Look at that. It's right in the middle. Isn't that good? So now I'll advance it a little bit more, a little more, a little more. Now look at what's happening. Let me show you. Let me get another shaving. I'll get a few going here. So we've got... We've got this nice camber going. Man, I must have hit something. Look at that shaving though. So... Ugh coming apart. Do you see how it's a little thicker in the middle and it gets like, I can't, it's falling apart. I need <laughs> a shaving that'll stay together. All right, so I've already got that side. Now I'm getting to the other side and it's a little, this one has a little kind of crazy figure in it.
But look at it's such a pleasure to use. I'm, I'm watching that whole surface get clean. And if I had a snipe in this, that's it. No edges cutting at all. I feel a very subtle, subtle scalloping to it. But you see it right there? Look at it. I don't know. Let's flip it over. Let's see how the other planes are working. I tuned up. Well, you know what? I'm gonna, that's enough for this one. I'm going to go to the big one. We want to have enough time. Get this out of the way. All right. Lots of obstacles in the shop tonight. <laughs> it's a mess, isn't it? I'm, oh, no, they're just the benches. Are... I'm a mess tonight. It's good. Okay, so let's put this up. And John says, I have a fairly old Stan Stanley Bailey number five, and the shavings get caught between the chip breaker and the bl blade. What's Ooh. the best way to dress the chip breaker? You've got to lay the chip breaker. Um, I'd have to show you that. I, I do show that in the sharpening a hand plane video. How long ago was that? That was a while. That was three, three or four years maybe. We can put the link to that or you can go look at yeah. it. It's just uh, sharpening a hand plane, something like that. You want to address the chip breaker. Where the chip breaker, like if this is the back of the blade, where the chip breaker meets it along the back flat, that chip breaker leading edge has to be dead flat because you've got a little gap in it. So the shavings are getting up under there. And maybe, yeah, that's what has to be happening. That, if that makes a really tight contact, so you do that by just lightly honing the chip breaker without the screw in it on the stone so it sits flat. Look at this, huh? Is that a nice top or what? Three boards. Beautiful cherry. It came out great. We talked about how I was going to arrange them last week. And I had to rip those boards, as I was saying last time, because they were cupped and twisted. But I glued them back exactly how they were. And you can just barely see where it is occurring, like down this center. And I think they'll match up quite nicely. And you won't hardly notice that I had to rip them. But... Um, I'm really pleased with how the joints came out. And let's, this is so long, I cannot use my bench dogs. So I'm going to clamp it at the end here. Let's see if I can clamp it down here. Yeah, that's awesome. I can clamp. It's as long as my bench. It's like 84, 84 inches long right now. So I'll put another one back here. Do you lubricate the plane, Tom? Sole yes, plane? I, I also put wax on the sole. Wax is good for the sole. <laughs> and, oh, let's do this. I'm going to put some pencil mark on here. Can you see this? This is a good idea because you'll know if you've actually planed the surface. And it's very... If you can keep the pencil from breaking. Uh. I think I'll just stay on this side for now. But this is pretty well planned. I can feel little height changes. I'm going to sand this like to two, with 220. Probably use an orbital after I do this just in case. Now sometimes it's un, almost unavoidable to get little tear outs with hand planes in spots. And when you get those tear outs, you can address that with a card scraper. Just lightly card scrape that spot. And you need to sand after you card scrape anyway because card scraping is more of a crushing action. All right, so. Do you use chalk, uh, chalk instead of pencil? I don't want to use chalk because it's going to um, affect the slipperiness. It's going to give more grip. So I want to keep it sliding. All right, so here we go. I'm going to start right here and 
Do I just walk down the whole thing? I don't know. Let's see what it feels like. I think you're supposed to tell us. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making this up. Yeah. Oh, that feels cool. You know what? I should have some like ice skates on or something. Wow, so I see it. I have some kind of weird little snipe down here and right in the middle there. So I'm skipping by right here and right there. So I'm going to just move over to the right. See that? <laughs> I'm just going to go about this far right now. I'll pick it up down there. I can see the beautiful color coming off. He needs a young apprentice, Dan. What? Dan said you need rollerblades, and I said you need a young apprentice. What do you mean? You don't think I can still do this? <laughs> I can still do this. I'm sorry. I was going by your joke. I wasn't making a own <laughs> assessing no, comment. <laughs> no, I'm not. I, I think you're completely confident. Oh, thanks. All right. I'm all out of breath. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I've got one board so far, but it looks amazing. I want to change planes to show you some others. I did put an edge, but I haven't even tried them out yet. Let's look at this one. Steve's asking, would starting with a joiner plane on a piece that large be better? No, Steve, actually, um, a joiner plane... That's if you want it absolutely dead flat. But the joiner plane, being longer, if this has a very subtle curve to it, it's going to take a long time to get those spots. You really don't want to use anything longer than a five for a top like this. In fact, I'm going to go to this four and a half in a minute because it would probably clean this up and you would never notice there was this very subtle dip in there. So why, why a five, not a seven? Because the seven is so long, it wants to true the entire surface to this perfect flat, like we don't, you don't need to shoot the surface. I'm not trying to shoot an exact straight edge. I'm trying to plain, smooth, a flat surface. So it's going to be close enough to flat. It, it's okay if you follow some of the natural movements of it. If I, so what I'm saying is if I took that long plane, the bed of it is this long. So you start going and you, you'll be skimming less area. So you want a shorter plane so it, it will work into the contours more rapidly and it's gonna be flat enough because it's going to be flattening it as you go. All right, so I wanna, I mean, if you really want, it's wood anyway, if you want a skating rink, you'd have to... <laughs> Can distinguish looking to smooth, not flatten. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, smooth, not flat. Ooh. I put a nice edge on this guy. I haven't used this for a little while. It's a little harder to adjust. That's why this is the low angle number five jack plane from Lee Nielsen. Let's look at where this shaving is coming out. Sort of the middle. Got to advance it a little more. I'm going to loosen it up a touch to advance and tighten. Okay, let's see what happened. I'm going to change my position here. Oh man, that is that a shaving or what? Look at that, it goes out. That has a subtle little camber on it. What are you doing? I'm just coming over a different direction. Oh, I okay. It's getting caught That's up there. That's a little too heavy of a shaving. I'm going to back it off. Okay, that's nice now. All right, so I'm going to work this area here. See, I've got like a little high spot there. I haven't quite hit this low spot right in here. Now this top had a twist in it. So 
That might be... That's not part of it, though. So this is waxy. It's not... I'm not killing myself, you know, pushing this. You can see how wispy these... Look at the shaving now. Can you see it? I'm trying it's, to hold still, okay. All right, I'm going to try to hold my fingers behind it. It's translucent, really. But look how wispy it is out at the edges. See that? That's the camber. It's very subtle. You can see through the whole thing, but there's no edges digging because this has this really subtle camber on the blade. And wow, what a polished surface that is. And I'm getting zero tear out. Now this is exciting programming. Can you hear me breathing? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said, your microphone. Yeah, John, John's here. He said, your audio sounds great. Is it better, John? Yeah. He's like, <laughs> I just probably did it there. I was like, <sighs> like anyway. I know that happens. I tried to move it down a little. So I, saw, I still saw a little pencil mark there. What's great about doing the pencil mark is you just go until you know you see it all gone. Now I still have a little in this area. So keeping in mind, I'm going for smooth, not necessarily dead, flat, flat. It's, there is that difference, I guess. Now I've got a snipe up here. Can you come closer? Sure. Should you have a mask on? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? For the virus? I know. I think for dust. There's no dust. This is shavings. Oh, I don't know. Come on up. Michael's saying you need a mask. Oh, maybe because you're breathing so much and you're going to give me COVID. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late. I'm I think. not sure. All right. So we've got a snipe right here. Watch. Okay. Can I see that? Well, you might be able to. Can you see the pencil? Let me do this. Can you see that? Am I looking for a snipe or your pencil? Pencil. Okay, I think so. I can see it from here. Now? Yep, can see. Okay, so watch. I'm going to plane from this end. All right, it's leaving as fast as I'm planing. But that's a low part right there. That's a snipe. And that, I was going to have to leave some of that in there. But now you're never going to see the snipe because I'm cleaning that right off. Wow, this thing is just polishing it. That section you're working on curly, Charlie's asking? It does have like some dynamic figure to it. Should be interesting to see how it looks with the finish. Will you sand after you smooth with the plane? Yes, I'm going to have to because there are little issues here. I'll show you in a second using the card scraper to detail any little cuts. Like I can feel actually the edge of this is just sticking out a little because it's probably gotten pulled out of shape. I'm going to go to my next plane. When, when would you use a 7 or 8? Or it, does an 8 even exist anymore? Yeah, the 8 exists. Um, in fact, Dave is restoring an 8 for me. I have Dave G. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> um, a 7 and 8 is, usual, is used more for truing when you want, what did we say a second ago? Flat? When flat you want, or smooth. Flat versus smooth. Yeah, when you want true flat of an edge so that, you know, like you could shoot an edge of a door or you want to make your own straight edge, you could use a number 7. That's what it, the longer the bed, the more accurately it will create a straight edge or flat surface. All right, so I'm bringing out now, this is a specialty, kind of a specialty plane um, style. It's called, a, it's a number four and a half. So it's a half because of the extra width. It's got a, a wider blade, a wider sole, but this is the number four, so it's much shorter. 
And this is a, called a smoothing plane. It's usually the last plane you want to hit the surface because this I usually do keep set very fine with a camber, a very subtle camber. It's like the polishing step. It's, it's almost like, whoops, I accidentally turned on the air. It's almost like the, the last grid of sandpaper if you were sanding a surface. So it's a great tool to have set up. So let's see how it is set up. I think I gotta adjust it out a little. I don't have it adjusted yet. And yes, you guys who are in the class, you can try this tomorrow. <laughs> All right, so I'm going down. Look at that. Look at that beautiful shaving. You see how wispy it is at the edges? Catch your breath. What do you mean? So I sound. <laughs> you see it? Mm -hmm. I yeah. can't tell. Well, it's, it's how feathery it goes at the edges. So there's zero digging. It's just a beautiful surfacing tool. I'm going to bring it out just a touch more. Now this has more weight to the body too. So it's not the kind of plane. Look at that. These are so nice. So now I'm going to let the smoother do its thing. It's just skipping along where it's hitting. All right, I'm going to do a little work here so I can get out of breath and show you how good a shape I'm in. What angle is that low angle plane sharpened to? Um, I, I did the 35 on all of them. But the low angle is bevel side up. So the, the actual, um, what's the right word for this? The actual angle that it's introduced to the surface is at the angle of the bed, which I think is 12 and a half plus the 35, so 47 and a half degree kind of net angle. All right, I'm a little low right here. This is interesting. I'm gonna scribble here. I can still see planar marks here. I have like this little low spot for some reason. Can you see that pencil? So I'm gonna just kind of detail this area with the smoother. I gotta hit it over here. Okay, can you see the pencil? I'm down to just a little pencil right there. It's hard to get so close because you're moving so fast. Oh, of. sorry. That's it. Doing your work. All the pencil is gone. It's beautiful. <laughs> oh, man. You're going to go through the sanding process after, right? And talk about what grit and all that, right? Um, Not exact. I've, I don't have much time left tonight, but I would just put an orbital to this at probably, um, I'm going to first hit it with a card scraper just to make sure I've cleaned up any little cuts <coughs> or digs. Here's where I was a little low as well, where the, the longer planes wouldn't get in there. So look, I'm almost halfway. This is the halfway point of it. Steve's saying that he's heard that you should clear the shavings after each stroke or two because the shavings slide back down into the opening <coughs> of the blade and cause an imperfect cut. <coughs> you heard that? Uh, it's true that they will get stuck in there, but I'm not having that issue right now. I don't. Look, they're not, they're not, they're not getting stuck right now. I don't stop every time. There's too many. Only if I find them getting jammed. Why go to the smoother after the low angle 62, Dave Dustin? Oh, I'm just showing it. Oh, okay. Plus, it's getting into the little, there's some, for some reason, there's some little low spots here that this shorter body is getting into. Like I have another one here. Like I had that one up in the corner. It's 
see the shaving doing that. That's, I'll get it when it's a problem. So, these are some, look at the full width with a soft little, I don't feel any edge digging. That, the, Bob's asking if that's the uh, plane the guilt gave you. No, this is it. The, the, uh, the low angle I was using. Who's that, Bob? Bob. Bob C. So, here it is. See? Can you see that? I don't want to read it, but it was from hosting the guild from 2009 to 2012. Right a long here. time ago. Wow. Yeah, that went by fast. So, what are you looking to achieve with the number four smoother that you can't get with the 62? Is that did you describe that maybe when you just said? Um, you can use the 62 like a smoother. You can have it ground. It can be a smoother. The only reason I went, I wanted to show you a smoothing plane and also take advantage of the shorter body to get into this little swale. So I have another one right, right here. I still got a little, I can still see little planar marks. So I'm going to get that just like I did that one up there. So I'm going to move around the surface like that. And I feel really good about how this is working. I know I've eliminated any snipes down here. When I sand this top, there'll be no surprise dips or divots. The last thing I want to show you is just how you can use a card scraper effectively. Now, where is it? What, what is the disadvantage to skip planing and just go through to the sanding grits or the advantage of planing first? You, if you just go through the sanding grits and you have a snipe on the board, this is what I was trying to say earlier, you will not eliminate that snipe. I know you think you will. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you will. Maybe you If you, you start really experience. coarse. I've done this. Uh, you can eliminate it with... Uh, with the belt sander in a way, but that's an aggressive sanding. But machines that have in-feed and out-feed rollers are notorious for creating snipe and issues like that. So you, if you glued up some boards that were run at different times, or you ran it through a drum sander, and what if you, sometimes when they're going through the drum sander, it gets bumped or drops a little bit, and it makes a snipe in the middle of the board. It's very hard to see. You can sand through the grits and think you're there. It feels great. But when you start putting the finish on, it shows up. It's like a little halo, like a line going across the wood. And that's why. This hand planing will skim across and it creates, you can tell that you've taken out any kind of lines going down. You don't have to hand plane. You can do it. You can pick up a locomotive belt sander. Mm -hmm. <laughs> those are expensive. I was looking at them on eBay just for kicks. And like some of those big old ones are like five, six hundred bucks. So, but that's the thing. You just want to be reassured that there's no machine marks on there. And hand planing is a surefire way to be sure you've you've got a pristine, beautiful surface. All right, so I just want to show you the last bit of, I'm going to come over there. So I'm just going to quickly tune this up. So this is a, a card scraper. It's already been honed to a perfectly sharp kind of 90 degree edge. So this is a flat edge here, and I've got a 90 degree corner here, a 90 degree corner here, same on the other side. Now. The trick to a, a card scraper is that you turn a burr, you roll a little burr down the edge, a hook of metal, and that's the genius, the cutting edge of this. So I'm going to just push the burr over here. This is the thing that takes the most practice when you're just starting out using card scrapers, 
is pushing over the burr. I'm going to put a little mineral oil on there. That's why I have that piece of MDF, so I don't get the oil all over the place. Did you show this on that hand plane video as well, I think? No, I did a special uh, card scraper video. Oh, okay. So you can go back and see this more. You can see the earlier part. But once you get it honed, then I'm going to straw, I'm going to uh, draw it out. So while it's flat, I'm going to use this hardened steel burnisher. It's polished. And just draw out the edge. That's what this is doing. I'm pressing down flat and preparing the edge for the burr. Last one. Okay, so that's four edges. Now I'm going to overlap it slightly and come from the bottom. And if I was at 90, I'd be right about there. But I want to bring it out about 10 degrees. And I'm pushing up on that edge to create a little hook there. See that? About 10 degrees. I'll do just like three strokes. And I've got a hook, that burr, running down the whole edge. You can hit another one like that fast. This pound for pound and price wise is the most effective tool in the cabinet. I mean these are less than 10 bucks. I get this one from Lee Valley. It's a beauty. There are other Sandvicks but I, I love this Lee Valley one. It's just right. The hardness of the thickness of it. Okay, so there it is. I got four burrs on there. There's several ways of pushing the burr over. That's just the way I learned a long time ago. And I get a, a strong burr with that method. I just can't screw caps on it. I was going to say, why are you showing that to what? us? I'm not trying to show you. <laughs> like we were making a major presentation of that process. <laughs> Now here's screwing the cap on. <laughs> no, let me practice. So what was the name of the tool, the burnisher that you were Yeah, a burnisher. Uh, there are different styles of burnishers. Charlie um, is asking. It's a piece of steel, a polished piece of steel. Um, if you're desperate and needed one, you can use the shank of a drill bit. A drill bit is a hardened piece of steel, but it's not polished or as long as this. The length of this helps you push it up or down and roll and push that burr over. There are gadgets to help you push the burr as well, but uh, that's just a freehand method that is not that hard to acquire. All right, so I've got these beautiful hooks on here, and I'm going to just kind of lean it till it catches. So I would only address little areas where I feel any tear like I can feel a little edge from, I think it was that earlier 62, right there when it got pulled out of flat. And I can just come in here and just lightly fine tune that. And look at the difference. These are shavings too, but look, these are so light. Here's the difference. I don't know if you can tell. This is a, a, a cut with a a sharp edge. This one is cut with the hook of the burr along the edge, but it's the action to get this is more of a crushing action, but this is so soft. It's like downy soft where this has more texture, like a shaving. This makes no noise. <laughs> so anyway, you know, you, you would say, why can't you just do the whole top with that? Well, it would take you a lot more effort, and it actually isn't as reliable to get out all the defects as a plane is. So this is usually a detailing tool. It's a wonderful tool because it doesn't care if you go against the grain, you're in wild figure. It's really great to use around knots. We have swirling figure going each way and you get a beautiful polished edge. I wish I had some of that around, but I mean, look at it. This is where I haven't even planed yet. But you really have to 
you really have to sand after this because I can see it's hazy. You're getting a crushing action here. Where I hand plane, it's dead polished. And I see the clarity and the color of the cherry. And then after, so after planing and detailing any ridginess or anything, I would then probably come up with a, just 220 on an orbital. It's probably enough. You, you could go back to 150. So that feels great. I would then, I'm going to finish with a, with a piece of 220 on a sanding block and I would just sand with the grain to finish. And then I think I would jump, for this table I'm going to go to 320 just to, it doesn't take you long. I double up on the ends usually like that. This is so long. but. Then I've, I've removed any, if there's any type of swirl marks, which really you rarely get. And that's looking awesome. It feels super smooth. I've got no snipe issues. I just have a perfect surface ready for finish. So I'm going to get this done on Saturday morning and get it over to Mark early afternoon. I've got to radius the edge slightly and cut it square to the... Uh, 80 inch, 82 inches long by 40 inches wide. So it should be a nice little meeting table. I've got some questions for okay. you, sir. Okay. Um, as you go across the tabletop, do you start switching hands? Switching hands? Mm -hmm. um, no. I'm going to just go about halfway here. I'm going to have to try it from the other direction. I'm hoping the grain looks fine. Sometimes I've had to plane left-handed like this. No, nope, the grain's going the wrong way. So this is actually going to work out great. I'll be able to go this way. So I'm going to go this direction. Okay, let me just finish this. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, so it won't take me long. And where it's uneven from the glue joint, that'll get leveled really quickly. And then when I sand, there'll be no worries. This so is going to be a sweet table. That was a question um, Steve had. When you go to the other side, will you plane from the other end going in the opposite direction only because you're tight, only because you're right-handed? Is it good to plane in opposite direction? You have to plane with the grain. So okay. if the grain is rising um, against you, sometimes it's awkward because it's not your natural move. What I use sometimes, I, you can use an American plane like a Japanese plane. So the Japanese planes are cut on the pull stroke. They're blocks of wood. They're really sweet. They tend to be wider. And the, you hold them and you pull. So you can, if you're stuck and you're going the wrong way, like if I was over here and it felt unnatural for me to push, the, you can use the pull action easier right or left handed. So I'm, I've got a snipe right there. So that's a dip right there. And I have to get that out because I got to come really close to this end. So I'll work you, that out. Do you ever raise the grain with spraying water? Um, yeah, if I'm using a aniline dye finish, like a water based dye finish, or a water-based finish of any kind. Uh, you've got to raise the grain. And even shellac will raise the grain a little. So it's good practice. If you hand plane the surface, the grain will raise very little. It's the sanding action that causes grain to raise and, and the card scraping action. But when you, when you hand plane, you're shearing the fibers so beautifully and smooth that microscopically, there's no fuzzy hairs to raise 
like you get with sandpaper. Okay, so just let's just clarify the card scraper you got from Lee Valley. Yeah. Uh, and we didn't mention where you might get a burnisher like that. Do you have a recommendation? I can't remember where I got that. It's been so long. <laughs> but almost every woodworking store would have that. Woodcraft, um, Highland Woodworking. I might have got it down there. Uh, there's so many good woodworking stores. Okay. David's asking, are there situations where you would not sand after doing all this prep with the planes and the scrapers? Um... If I, the only time I wouldn't sand is if I came right off the plane because the scraper, as I was saying earlier, does not leave you as finished a surface. The scraper, even though it looks great, if you see it, it's a little hazier. It's a crushing action with the hook of metal. I'm like finding the pressure and I'm pushing and it's rolling that up where the cutting action with a plane is slicing the fibers off. So if you can set a very subtle camber, there are times I just try to work like right off the tool. Like it'd be fun to make that shaker end table with a drawer right off the tool. Very often when I'm building the back of a cabinet, like uh, even if it's a raised panel out of poplar or uh, occasionally white pine, a frame and panel, I've done them where I just, everything is left right off the hand plane and I just hit it with shellac at the end and it's cool because I'll use on the panel sometimes I'll use a heavier uh, camber to have that really more accentuated scalloping to show the maker's tool the you know the the fingerprint of your having been there could you do that burnishing uh, trick you did uh, in a vise yes yeah yeah, it's, uh, I show that on that video, I believe. If you go back and look on the card scraping, sharpening and using a card scraper, we'll make a link to that, right? Yep. Uh, you can see that, that option. There's a, you gotta hold it a certain way. And there are, j are little gadgets that you can use to create that burr more easily. But, um, and there's, I think I show three different ways to push the burr. Fred's but. asking how you cut a table that size. Oh, good a question, Fred. I don't have any idea. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we hope to no. figure it out by Saturday morning. Well, this one, I'm going, I'm actually almost right at the edge. If that's the Fred who uh, is part of the class, is it? No, nope. oh, different Fred. Okay. I was going to say, you could give me a hand tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can rip it on the table saw if you need, but you know what I have? Um, I have one of those Festool track saws, and I'm going to use it for this. You could get it up on, on the felder and cross cut it as well. Um, it's 40 inches wide, so it, it could easily. Are they going to come here and use yours? Because I don't think they have one of those. Oh, well, I was talking to myself. <laughs> no, but I do have the Festool track saw, and that's a dream because I'll just lay the track on my line and I'm just going to go right across. Then I'm going to clean up the end grain with a low angle block plane. Um, actually, I'm going to put a very slight radius edge, the one I like to put on a lot of stuff. So it'll have a softer edge, but it won't be rounded over. And so it'll be friendly, but it's going to be a rectangle. I'm not rounding the corners or anything like that. So it looks like sanding takes away the clarity of the plane gives it. How do you get that back? Oh, it comes back. Yeah, it does subtly take it, but it's not enough. When the finish hits it, you'll get it. I'm, I'm going to sand to 320. That'll bring it a little back. What? Somebody... <laughs> say something bad. Something about your hair. Oh, my God. Brandon says nice hair. <laughs> I know. Yeah, when he gets working, it's, it's, it's just, uh, it has a life of its own. It's humid. It's, it's humid. I just can't do a thing with it. <laughs> 12,000 grit. Oh, I'm sorry. Some of that's something else. Okay. Oh, Dan's saying, so you're offering the use of the felder, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm moving around this side. Well. Okay. 
Yeah. I'm I, not sure that that answered the question about how you're going to cut that table because. No, I'm going to cut it with the. I mean, the how track these saw. guys could cut it because you're kind of naming tools that. Not no, I mean that's that's a pretty commonly available Is tool. That right. You don't have to have uh, the fest tool now. A lot of other makers are making the track saws, so that you just lay the track and you just plunge with the circular saw. It's like a finish cut circular saw. They were amazing. I mean, they, when you hook them up to the vacuum, they're zero dust, so you can even do it in a house. So anyway, all set? I think I've covered all the questions. Okay. Guys, I'm sorry if I missed somebody. Well, thank you. I didn't, I didn't want to bore you with doing the entire top. In reality, I didn't want to pass out. <laughs> I actually wasn't that tired. So the secret to planing large surfaces like this without getting tired is to have have it set for a fine shaving, have a sharp edge, a nice subtle camber, and a wax sole. Wax is good for the sole. <laughs> and you will have a pleasant time planing your surface. So, okay. is that it? I think that we've covered them all. All right. Hey, if you like this content, would you please subscribe already? No, thank you for subscribing if you have already. And if you haven't, please consider and also like, share, and ring that bell. Thank you all for those <laughs> who have. And thanks for being involved. This is a lot of fun for me. It's great to see so many people into it. And we have great plans for new courses coming up. So stay tuned. If you're not on our mailing list, you can get on at epicwoodworking.com and learn about every new course, free courses, free courses with giveaways, all that's going on here at Epic Woodworking. So thanks so much from the camera lady and myself. Thank you for being part of this. We will see you next time right here on Shop Night Live. <laughs> Good night. Have a great fourth, everybody.